Welcome everybody to Service Drive Revolution. I'm Chris Collins. This is Christian Lafferty. Hello. Today we have a guest. We are going to talk about marking retention and alignments for life. Yeah. In a sense. Yep. It's it's a great conversation. And then we're gonna we're gonna talk about stress in the workplace, mental illness. And that that conversation gets very, you know, intimate and emotional, but very relevant to our time, I think, especially because it does, does it not seem like a lot of people are on edge? Oh, for sure. It's very interesting. Why is everybody so on edge? Yeah, I, I wish I knew why. As a matter of fact, I was just in a, I was in a store a few weeks ago. So I walk in there um, and great people, it's, a, you know. <laughs> I can't tell if this is a segue to a joke. Yeah, and I understand that. Um, <laughs> is it? it was, it's, it's kind of a funny story, but not necessarily a joke. Does this end with like, so what do you call an advisor that something something? No. Okay. So um, So you're in a store. Yeah, I'm in a store. Going there for the first visit. Where is this store? Michigan. Michigan. So North Michigan, Auburn Hills area. Um, beautiful part of the country, actually. I had no idea until I went there. But... Uh, Walked in and, and sat down for what, what we call like our opening meeting that we do with the general manager and the service manager. And, and these two ladies are amazing people. And, and we're sitting down. I'm kind of going over like what the week looks like and all those wonderful things like setting the table for what I need to have happen and all that other stuff. And they're like, well, well we just want to let you know um, we haven't had anybody in our store for a while. We, uh, we're, we're a little bit worried about you being here. And I'm like, why? They're like, well, the last person... Um, that uh, that we had come into the store to to help us out. It's been several years now, and and we really liked him. Um, and uh, and you know he came in on Monday, and we had a good visit and everything like that. And you know Tuesday it's it's seven thirty in the morning. Um, he wasn't there, and I'm like, oh okay, that's it's kind of weird. I'm like. Uh, all right, so he just showed up late, and they're like, no. So uh, 8 o'clock showed her up, showed up. We started calling his, his cell phone, and uh, I'm like, okay, so that's interesting. I'm thinking at this point, like, the guy dodged. He's like, okay, I can't, I can't deal with this store. It's broken or something like that, and they're like, 9, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, they call the hotel, and they're like, hey, can you buzz the room? They buzz the room, no answer or anything like that. And they're like, well, if you come over, we'll, we'll walk you up to the room, let you knock on the door and everything like that. So the service manager and the general manager go over to the hotel, go up to the third floor, and then they, uh, uh, they knock on the door, nothing. So an agent actually lets them in to the room, um, and the, uh, the coach is dead on the floor. On the floor? Dead on the floor. Hookers and blow? Uh, not that they knew, um, but uh, it was pretty interesting. So, like, these two then uh, do what anybody would do, and they start cleaning up the room and uh, packaging all of the personal belongings and everything like that of this coaching consultant. And uh, They didn't call 911? Well, I think it was already too late by that point. So I'm pretty sure the hotel might have done that at that point. But, like, they just start cleaning up business as usual. In my head, I'm thinking, okay, so they're divvying up, like, uh, what are we going to do with this and everything like that? But yeah, they went to the funeral and uh, had all that stuff. And they're like, so we just want to let you know, like you need to do a good job because we kill people that. Uh, oh, that's their joke yeah, is that, that they'll, they'll whack you. Yeah. So, I mean, that is kind of like the Jimmy Hoffa era, right, area, right? Like that there's, there's some bodies buried up there, but thankfully I made it back. Like we had a great week, but I like that you, extra were pressure. You, were you worried? No. Um, but I do like the extra pressure. Did that pressure. really help your performance? <laughs> no, no, but it was a funny story. I never had it. I never come in after a dead person before into a store. So Are they sure they got into die of COVID? Pre-COVID? It's been years and years. Uh, it was a long time. Like, they took a break that was that. a That was a lot. Have you ever heard that uh, joke by Norm MacDonald, the moth joke? Oh, yeah, it's one of That's my favorites. That's what that one felt like. Yeah, but there was really no punchline. Well, it just kept, like, I was, then they're cleaning up. It's funny. Yeah, that's what my favorite part was, too. Is Why that are they, they cleaning they up? They up the room. I don't know. I mean, there's no manual on how to act when you walk in and your coach is dead. Yeah, there is. Really? 
Yeah, you call 911 or... And let them deal with it? Yeah, and don't touch anything. No, what if what if there's foul play? You don't want your dirty fingerprints on stuff. That's a good point. I'll let them know for next time. Maybe, be, I don't know, maybe I have different friends, but I back out slowly, <laughs> put my hands in my pocket. <laughs> These two are go-getters. They weren't afraid of any dead bodies. Rigor mortis does not just deter them in the least. Hilarious. That's great. Well, should we get to our esteemed guest? Yes. Jamie Morris. We're really excited for you to hear this conversation, and um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect you and touch you, and she's really smart, sweet. It's good. She's great. And that's all coming up on Service Drive Revolution! <laughs> Welcome, Jamie, to the show. How are you doing, Jamie? I'm doing well, thank you. So Jamie is what we call, Christian, a social media influencer. I like it. I don't know what it means, but I like it. She posts a lot of cool stuff that spark conversations and ideas, and she's genuinely curious about our industry. And speaking, so, Speaking of conversations, so there were two muffins. They're sitting in an oven. <laughs> This is the thing, Jamie, is you got to let him laugh, and then you go on. Yeah, right? you got to let him get right. it out. Yeah. Right, right so, off the top. So the two muffins are sitting in an oven, and one muffin turns to the other and says, So these muffins... They're in an oven. They're in an oven together. Together, side it, by and side. And the oven's on. That's right. So yeah. the one muffin turns to the other muffin and says, Man, it's hot in here. And then the other muffin looks at that one and says, Wow, a talking muffin. <laughs> That one hurt a little bit, I'm not going to lie. All right. Key <laughs> to happiness, low expectations, Jamie. <laughs> so, J um, Jamie is, Christian, a customer service experience manager at a Scooby-Doo dealership one in Massachusetts. One of both of our favorite brands. I love Scooby-Doo. I wrote service for Scooby-Doo, Jamie, when I was a kid. I love the brand, honestly. It's great. So, you, you have a couple interesting posts I, I want to talk about. Let's start with the first one. That it it I maybe you feel the same way, but it it's interesting to me the way people approach and see things. So you you put up a question and you said doing some research on creative ideas today. I stumbled across Firestone, who offers lifetime alignments. I called them incognito to see what it's all about. And apparently you pay $179.95 for the first alignment. For as long as you own the vehicle, you get alignments for free. If a shop does this and internalizes an alignment, let's say once a year, paying the tech their time at their rate, do you see this as a customer retention tool and selling opportunity or just a waste? And so give me a general sense about the feedback that you got from that and then i'll tell you my my opinion yeah sure so it was uh, if you read through the comments it was a very wide range um there was a lot of you know oh, it's a great idea then there was some people that were just flat out saying no uh wouldn't work can't work there's no way it'll work um i had one comment um from a bdc person who actually said that you know you don't really need it as long as you can offer a great experience the customer will come back you don't need retention tools um, so there's kind of just a lot of different ways to look at it, I guess, which I guess is why I post the way that I do. Um, it's just to show there's just such a broad, you know, range of answers that you really just have to make it work for your specific dealership, I think. I think that everybody kind of has a different ebb and flow. Um, it's just you have to really get to know what makes your customers tick and what makes your department tick. Yeah. But so just in general, though, when we, when we talk about using that as a retention tool because that's what they're doing right right you do have to have some sort of marketing to get people in so they can experience the great customer service so just having great customer service in and of itself doesn't give you the opportunity without the customers and so there has to be something that brings them in exactly so it always surprises me how thin-sided people are in their comments where they're not looking at the whole picture as, hey, as managers, as, you know, us running running service departments, 
we have a basic toolbox and you don't have to use that to, you know, you go to the toolbox and you need a screwdriver, but all you have is one wrench. You can't use the wrench where you need the screwdriver. And so what I, what I, you know, admire and like about the way you're approaching this is you're asking like, Hey, there, this has to be working because people are doing it. So, you know, let's, I just wish the conversations were, were deeper and more insightful than judgmental and that won't work. That's stupid. You know, it just, that's gosh. social media though. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a platform yeah, for the keyboard just, warriors. So it's, it, I take it with a grain of salt. You know, I, I just really genuinely like starting that conversation and, and get people thinking and maybe somebody who's just like me, who just genuinely wants to know is thinking the same thing, but doesn't necessarily ask. Um, so I just like to throw it out there and then just kind of see what happens. Um, and so far it's been great engagement. So, yeah, no, and it's a great question. So I want to this point though, um, Patricia here in the office who saw this, Hello. can you, can you hop on zoom really quick? Uh, yeah. She loves Firestone. It is the craziest thing ever. She, she's told us for, and guess who bought that lifetime alignment? She did. <laughs> Patricia, so we're talking about the the Firestone lifetime alignment, and I'm telling Jamie how much you love Firestone. Like you literally have have confessed your love for Firestone more, more than your love for your kids. Like you, you've gone out of your way, and when you've said to me, like, oh, I had to drop my car off for service today, and I'm like, oh, which dealership? You're like, no, Firestone. Has your, <laughs> has your car ever been to the dealership for service? Nope, just when I bought it. Yeah, so see that, Jamie? So in you know, posing the question that, that, that you posed, isn't it fascinating that dealerships lose 80% of their customers to independents, and nobody wants to understand what the independents are doing? You know what I mean? So Patricia, tell us why you love Firestone Lifetime Alignments. Something in my past brought me to understand that an alignment is like the most important thing for me. I drive two hours a day, um, maybe not that many miles, but I'm on the road and in the roads of downtown all the time. So for me, my car being in alignment for some reason just like equals gold. So I actually um, took my car to Firestone the very first time just to get the a nail out of the tire. And the guy said, hey, you know, you need the nail of the tire, but also we do alignments and the alignment was like $99. So he said, or we do lifetime alignments and it's, I think, $179 or 199 And I was like, lifetime? Well, I'm going to definitely need at least one more time. And I'm religious about getting it done. So it felt, felt like it was an amazing deal. And why the heck not? It's right down the street. I know the guy's name. His name's Andrew. Calls me. His name's actually in my phone. Andrew Firestone is in my phone. <laughs> Uh, so there's, there's no, he knows my husband's name. He, they just did the, uh, the alignment, actually the lifetime alignment got me. So I don't understand why every dealership isn't doing that. Like if I would have got my, my car at, uh, the Hyundai dealership and they said, we have lifetime alignment. It's only 179. I would have driven the 20 miles to drop off my car. It's in Huntington beach. Why would I not want to go to Huntington beach <laughs> to get my car fixed and have lunch and hang out? pick my car back up and go home. It makes perfect sense. But instead, and what I thought was really great about Jamie's post is like the comments are all like Firestone, what a junky place. And uh, the dealership, we're amazing. We don't do alignments <laughs> for 179. And to me, it's like, you're totally missing the point. I'm the customer. I'm the customer. I'm telling you, you know how much money they've made off of me. And not only that, guess who else's car goes there? Brian's. We're not going that's, to two different places. That's her husband. Yeah, yeah. no, we're not going to two, two different places. We're taking one car, we're dropping off the, the other car. Like, I, I don't understand why you, people want to, like, um, say crap about it. I've had a great experience with Firestone so far, um, and I will continue to go to Firestone. And I, I again, I totally trust them. So, but now the dealership had the opportunity to have saved me and kept me as a lifetime customer because I will probably continue to buy Hondas. But I'm not going to go back to that Hyundai even to get my my next car. I don't care about that Hyundai dealership. They, anyway, they lost a lifetime customer. No lifetime alignment. No lifetime purchasing. One more thing, uh, Mama Bear, before you go. What um, what year is your Hyundai? 2013. 
Yeah. So not going to the dealership. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So what do you what do you think about that, Jamie? I think, you know, she's absolutely right. You know, a lot of times when I'm contemplating, you know, a decision or, you know, something that I think I should pitch to the service manager or to the GM, um, I think about myself as a customer and what I kind of look for um, because I'm honestly not, you know, I don't have a crazy fancy car. I have a 2014 Nissan Altima. Um, I kind of think of like, what's going to, what would I look for? Um, I will be honest, I'm terrible about going to the same place more than once. Like if I get my hair cut, I probably got to cut like 10 different places just because I'm last minute. Um, so usually, you know, I'm looking for a deal or I'm looking for something to just kind of like grab my attention and bring me in. Um, so a lot of, you know, dealerships say, oh, we do oil change for sixty four ninety five or, and that's great in that one time. But like, if you can just grab that person and, and make sure that they're coming back, a person that would usually jump around that, you know, has so much value in it because, you know, otherwise they just might come in for that one oil change and then never come back again because they're just going to go somewhere else last minute. Um, but if they're like, oh, well I have, you know, my free alignment, so maybe I should get my oil change done at the same time. Um, you know, and you kind of make a point to go back to that one place. Yeah. So let's talk about your lack of commitment. So what happened in your childhood that you get your hair cut at a different place every time? So were you abandoned as a little kid, raised like Tarzan in the jungle? What happened? Tell us the no, story. No, really. We've I got just, all day. In my personal life, if you know me, I am just, uh, I'm, I, my doctor told me I had ADD. So I just, I'm all over the place constantly. I can't really focus on anything, um, you know, like that. So it, it just comes up in my head. I'm like, oh, I need a haircut. I got to go to some place that's going to get me in. That's kind of my thought process on that one. Are you married? I am not. No, I, I was married. Um, so I did a lot of moving around. Uh, but no, I'm not right now. How long were you married? Eight years. Oh, okay. Well, that's commitment. You were thinking that's two years, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. That's <laughs> long, <laughs> no, longer than was, Christians. There was some uh, commitment there. <laughs> yeah. Probably not true. No, it's not. But it was funny. I'm trying to be funny. It's more of a focus okay. thing, I think, than a commitment thing. So is that what ruined your marriage? Was your ADD? No, no. <laughs> Something totally different. I wish I could say it was that, honestly, but <laughs> that's funny. Um, so we do, Jamie, have clients on the dealership side that do lifetime alignments, by the way, and are very successful with it. They do charge more than 179, I think. So they're charging like 249. I will tell you that they sell a ton of them, and most of the time, I think they're doing two. Okay. It's not as many as you think. It's not seven. It's not five. The average is two, and there's just as many people that do it once and forget they have the lifetime, which is a failure in communication, mm -hmm. um, but it is very successful, and we have a couple managers that that's like their go-to and they're selling hundreds of them a month. That's awesome. Yeah. So it is no a very effective either. approach. Yeah. Yeah. I think the big thing is that, you know, just like what you're saying, Jamie, is that when you're thinking about specials or what to offer the customer, a lot of times we get in a really bad habit. We don't think like the customer first. Like, what is the customer looking for? What is it that they'll drive them back? But the truth is, when it comes to traffic and retention, there's they've got to have a reason to come back, right? So I was just, I was just kind of thinking about that, like, like you and the haircut. So, like, what would it take for you to go to the same person every single time? Wait, so let me answer yeah. that. Let me try to answer that, Jamie, and then you tell me how I do. Um, they would have to be available 24-7 at the last minute all the time. Okay, so they'd have to have open availability. What else though? Like, How much could we charge you for that if we had that? Like an on-demand barber, that like what's the normal haircut cost? Like 60 bucks? Like 60 bucks, yeah. So would you pay 100 if it was on-demand anytime you 100%. wanted last minute? 100%, yep. yeah. yes, See? I would. Good job. yes I would. So I just figured out how to get more money out of Jamie. That's right. But but you did it by thinking like her. And I think that's the lesson is, is that, you know, especially with this thing. Part. That's, that's a very important missing part is I think a lot of people think they just know because of, you know, previous experience or whatever, but you really just have to put yourself in the mind of the customer and just think of what they would want. And I think that if you've already spent money somewhere and you know that you're going to be getting something for free, why wouldn't you go back? Right. Well, I don't, you, you've I, already paid for it. I honestly have even a, like a little different approach to that is what, what I always like to do is look at things in the sense of, um, 
what is the result? What is the outcome, right? Like, so if we're, if we're doing all this work, what is the outcome of what we're doing? So it's the outcome of our approach, our mindset, our systems, our execution of the systems, all of it, right? It's the, it's the outcome. And most of the time what's lacking there is the psychology also. Like we're not, you know, we're not understanding that there's psychology involved in getting the customer to feel how we want. But on, when it just comes to dealerships in this conversation, we lose 80 to 85% of our customers to independence. That's all you have to say. <laughs> so why would we not... It was okay. No, that's not all I have to say. Let me add one more thing to that. We have home field advantage. We sold them the car and we do nothing to retain them from the car sale. And then we think that things like a lifetime alignments are stupid. And it's like, well, let's do something. Like, I don't know, free coffee isn't going to be enough. So there's like, we should, I just, we should be open to trying things instead of judging things. And I mean, you know, it's not, um, you're not going to burn the place down by trying a couple things and having an open mind. Yeah. Exactly. But exactly. It, but instead, you know, our industry is very, very much, you know, instead of thinking strategically, we'd much rather go towards, towards the bubbling cauldron of tribal knowledge. So your, your other post here, Jamie, that I, that I want to talk about, it's more of a, of a serious subject. Not that alignments aren't serious. Dead serious. Because they can be dead serious. Um, but you, you had a, a post. You said, I had a casual conversation at work about managing stress in the automotive industry. And then I'm just I'm going to kind of paraphrase this. Uh, that manager are uh, constantly angry, expressing their hatred for the industry, drinking, and are battling with health of their relationships outside of work. As hardworking... As a hardworking younger person, how old are you, Jamie? I'm 29. Okay. Trying to make my way in a highly competitive, mentally and emotionally demanding career, I will always take time for myself wherever I can, and I will always encourage others to do so. Put in your 40 or 50 hours, but do something for yourself too. I'd love to meet more mental health conscious employers out there who recognize the difference between hours worked and productivity. And so since posting that, like, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, I still honestly feel exactly the same. I think, um, you know, I, I think it's almost a badge of honor, you know, in our, in this industry to say, Oh, I work 70 hours, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's something that people kind of applaud. Um, which I think in a sense that it's very obviously very good to be hardworking. Um, you know, you definitely want to put in your time. You want to use your time wisely. But, you know, I would rather give somebody a pat on the back for, you know, hey, I got to go to my kid's hockey game, you know, instead of, oh, I work straight through it. Um, I think that there definitely needs to be more of a balance when it comes to, you know, time and your work life and your home life in the automotive industry. Because for most of what I've seen, for some great managers I've worked with, um, they're just burnt out. You know, the automotive industry is missing out on some really, really great, um, knowledgeable people to other industries that are working 40 hour work weeks or four day work weeks, you know, because they can take those same skills and move it over. Because, you know, you could work at a dealership and, and, you know, do your 60 hours, 50 hours, whatever it is. Or you could go, you know, into construction or something like that where you could use those same skills, but you don't have to work as many hours. Um, so it's, it's, it's just really unfortunate that it, it's kind of gone that way. So I'm just always hoping to spark that conversation and maybe I can catch the eye of a GM. Maybe I can catch, you know, the eye of a service manager. Take a look at their own team and just, you know, do a little... Um, reading on who they have and just see how everybody's feeling and you know if if somebody requests time off maybe instead of just jumping to no um because xyz really thinking about that person and think of what that would actually mean for them um you know in terms of just looking at the numbers portion of it yeah your your question made me made me reflect a lot and i thought a lot about it in the sense that you know i was a a kid that grew up really poor and so my parents were missionaries. And then when my mom and stepdad divorced, I, I was raised by a single mom. We literally were 
you know, bouncing around from couches. You could, you could say that we were homeless and it, it wouldn't be inaccurate. And, um, it was, you know, it was rough and I did not want to be poor. And I felt a lot of pressure as a young kid because I wasn't really good in school. Um, I did not have mentors. Like I didn't, the, you know, I just think back, like I had a soccer coach. So I, because I grew up in Mexico as a missionary's kid, I was really good at soccer and I was on a premier league team and I was courted and colleges were coming to look at me, but I didn't have good grades. And I had a coach that had played professional soccer and he was a younger kid that I kind of looked up to. And he, he kind of told me, he said, you know, if I was you, I would do something else, but professional soccer, you're going to go to college and then you're going to get drafted into Europe and it sucks. He goes, I hated playing in Europe. It doesn't pay that great. And he goes to the, you know, and so I literally just took that advice because I didn't really have male figures. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a dad, that sort of thing. And so I felt a tremendous amount of stress and I remember panicking. I remember not being able to sleep. I remember being really, really stressed out, but Back then, they didn't have a word for it. Nobody labeled it mental illness. And I think there, there is a, a thing that we need to understand is, to me, looking back on that, I look at that as part of growing up. And that stress and that insecurity and those sleepless nights and, you know, just feeling lost and like, you know, there was no way out many times, like many times. I remember sleeping in somebody's office, um, you know, and going to the gym to shower, like just feel like just, I felt like a loser in, in a lot of senses. And, you know, I, di I didn't have a path to college. Um, and you know, a lot of this is I could have played it different, but I, I didn't understand. And I, I didn't, you know, spend the time to figure it out, but I start working in a car dealership as a porter. And because I showed up on time, because I worked hard and I'm a natural leader, I got promoted. And then um, I start to hear what the service advisors are making. Now, back, you know, I'm 50. I'm almost 50. I'm going to turn 50 in January. Back when, when I was, you know, 17 at the time, when, when you hear that somebody's making $65,000 a year, that was like the equivalent of making 150 now. Like it was, it was a lot of money. And so I would have traded any amount of work, any amount of stress. I already had the stress. I already was stressed about bills and all the things that I was trying to do and what, you know, what's in front of me for, for, you know, opportunity and, um, panic attacks and all that. The car business allowed me to make as much money as I earned. And so I'm a kid now all of a sudden, 22, 23, I'm making $120,000. Like I think I made $122,000 my last year as an advisor. Now I would come in on Sunday and write the night drops. I would get there before everybody else and I would stay past every, you know, everybody else. And for me, the trade of how I felt before I had income and I could afford rent and not worry about bills. And, you know, I, I was making more than lawyers right out of law school that had all this debt. And I, I started to, to see it a different way. It's like, I have a career opportunity here where I can, I can earn as much as I want because really pay in the automotive industry is based on your performance more than it is an exchange of time for money, right? And I couldn't believe that the, the, you know, the better I treated my customers, the more I sold, you know, the more problems I solved, uh, the more I could make. And so 70 hours seemed like a fair trade for that. Now we, we come ahead and the, the industry is different. Things are easier there's automation, there's, you know, you're not doing handwritten ROs. There's, you know, there's so many things that make the job a lot easier and your, your generation and, and younger, 
don't exactly have the same feelings towards commission and you're more about, you know, freedom and time off and experiences where my generation was more about, you know, having a solid, secure career and income and that sort of thing. And so I do think it's an interesting thing, but most of the people, general managers that you're going to be interacting with came up like I did. And so they, they look at, not, you know, the lack of work ethic and the, um, you know, just the mention of the mental side or the emotional side as a weakness more than, than anything else. Um, and I think it's a, it's a, you know, fascinating conversation. I'm not, I'm not at all trying to, um, to push my point of view. I'm only trying to give you my context in reflecting that I think I am the way I am because of what a great opportunity the industry gave me. And I feel a debt of gratitude because let's face it, I was a loser. Like I didn't have a lot of options. I mean, I know I would have turned out okay either way, but the automotive industry was my catalyst to being okay. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I totally understand that. I, I definitely see, you know, my generation is, you know, va like you said, we value experiences, um, our time a little bit more. I just think that there is a way that you're able to get both of those. I think that you can get results. I think that you can sell. I think you just have to be smart about it. I think you absolutely are right. You have to put in the time. You just do. It's, it's that industry. You know, I um, when I was a music teacher before I, you know, got back into the automotive industry, I had done that because I was married at the time. I didn't have to make that much money. Um, so I was able to pursue something that was part time and something that I really, really enjoyed. Um, but when push came to shove and, you know, everything happened with that and I was supporting myself at that point, I fell back on the automotive industry and it treated me very well. You know, I went right back into service advising um, and I did really, really well for myself. Um, I worked for Dodge for a little bit um, and then I worked over at a Cadillac dealership and I was able to support myself, you know, have money left over. I was able to, you know, do fun things and all that. Um, and I was able to kind of make both work where I was working 50 hours or so. Um, but I was, I was very, um, firm about, you know, when I'm, when I'm off, I'm off. Like I, I can't constantly make myself available. Um, and I had to make sure that my managers understood that, um, you know, it's, it, I get it if there's an emergency or something like that, but you know, I, I learned how to keep all of my repair orders in order and every repair order could speak for itself so that nobody had to call me. Um, you know, I, I created a process so that everything was all set and I didn't have to worry about it. And I kind of had to just train myself to let it go, you know, and um, not stress about it. And I think that, that there has to be um, a split between, you know, work and home. It just it, it has to exist because, like I said, I, you know, I've experienced it myself where I'm like, I'm done. Like, I can't do this anymore. I've just worked 70 hours. I, I can't, you know, I'm going to lose my mind. Um, and I've seen, like I said, very, very capable and very, I mean, for lack of a better word, amazing managers that I've worked for um, that just they might ask for something so small. So like going to a kid's hockey game and, it, and they get told no, you know, after they just put in 60 hours. Um, so it's just making people realize that, yes, we're here to make money, but we're also people, you know, we're in the people industry as much as we're in the car industry, we have to learn to also be, um, you know, in the people industry, we have to treat people like people and not just numbers. I think that's more or less the point that I was trying to get across. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, definitely more of a conversation about leadership than anything, right? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, it is so interesting. Like, I do think there's a lot for us to learn from that, from, you know, Jamie's generation, because like, there is no, I can't even try to think about it. Like, I call it like the suck it up mentality. Like, you know, when, when you're talking about mental health and stuff like that, and I could just, I'm trying to imagine myself as an advisor going to my manager and saying, hey, I'm having this going on. And I, the, I can just hear two or three different managers like, be like, suck it up. Like, that's one of the things I think that if we're going to start to attract the next generation in, because obviously we're, all, we're not going to be here forever, right? So the suck it up generation's 
we're getting older. We're not gonna. We're not getting younger. So uh, we do have to figure something out. I think that there's a place for it. I think there's a place for uh, general managers and owners to actually kind of support the mental health of their teams. And I don't know. They're gonna have to kind of suck it up themselves and figure out how to um, incorporate that into the dealership world. But I will tell you that I'm having more conversations with dealer principals and general managers about the mental health of their employees. And they're getting way more concerned about making sure that they've got time off and that their stress levels are low. So I do think that we're slowly making the shift, Jamie. We're not all the way there yet. But I do agree with you that I think that, you know, there's a place for us to kind of take our foot off the pedal in terms of the amount of hours that we work. And you said something on the opening that really made sense when you said the 70 hour week is a badge of honor. Did you that resonate with you? Because I'm like, oh, yeah, like when I'm talking to managers, they're like, yeah, I put in 75 hours last week. That is absolutely a badge of honor. But really what it should be is about something like the badges in the hockey game. Right? Like in 30 years, we're not going to remember that we worked till seven instead of leaving at four and went to the game. So, so I'm, I'm more on, on her side than on the, the suck it up mentality. I think there needs to be a little bit of both. I think you can have suck it up, but you can also have a little bit of compassion. And I think that comes down to more or less taking the time to get to know your team and know who really means it and who's just looking for an excuse to go home. I think it's, you know, obviously if it happens every week, that's one thing. But if you have someone genuinely coming to you in your office saying, hey, I have this going on, I really need to leave a little bit early, you know, way, you know, do you really absolutely need them there? Is it going to make that much of a difference? Or can you make that moment in their life and let them go handle what they need to handle? Um, I think it, it just needs to be more of a discussion than just a straight across the board, like we don't leave early, we don't take days off, we don't do this. Because real in reality, life happens, you know, it happens to everybody. And um, like I said, I think the suck it up definitely needs to be there in a lot of points with definitely depending on the people or the person that, it, you know, you're talking about. Um, but I think that a lot of um, management specifically needs to work on that compassion aspect um, and the interpersonal skills um, and, you know, just really taking into account that they have people working for them and, and not machines. And it's it's just the reality of the world we live in. Yeah, it's great. Well. Thank you so much. Um, we're a big fan. We'll be following you. Tell everybody really quick where they can, where you want them to follow you online on social. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, my name is Jamie Morris, and that's really all I have. I don't really have much more than that. I, you know, I, I am a normal working person, and I just I post as things come up and as I'm thinking about things. So if you want to follow me, give me a follow, and I'll try and entertain you. I guess. <laughs> yeah, we love it. Thank you so much, Jamie. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Have a good night, guys. Bye. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Service Job Revolution. We're uploading new stuff every day, so make sure you subscribe and click the bell icon so you don't miss out. If you have a question you'd like us to answer on the show, call 8333-ASK-SDR and we'll answer your question on the show. That's 8333-ASK-SDR. For special deals on our books and training, head over to offers.chriscollinsinc.com. Now that's offers.chriscollinsinc.com. I'm Chris Collins, and I'll see you in the next video.